Hi, my name is Kevin McDonald, and I'm declaring my independence. Independence from what? Why, negative thoughts and energy, of course. Chief among them, hate, division, and fear. You see, I know that we're all one, and together we can solve any problem, save our planet and each other. Please, join me as we come together as one and choose a better way to be. So now, let's begin with my independence report. And welcome to the third hour of my independence report. This is Thursday, and it's become Music Thursday. Kayla, I have to say, I've enjoyed today immensely. It's been great fun. What do I you agree. think? I agree. Oh, <laughs> woman of few words. I'm going to get that's your Indian name from now on. Woman of few words. Okay. <laughs> no, you're doing you're doing really. <laughs> You're doing really well, and uh, Michael Stover is the one who is helping me put this together, and these folks work with him. And Robert Andrew Wagner of The Little Wrenches is with us for this hour. He is, We're going to play a couple of songs. We're going to talk to him about his music, about, about life, about how he got to be where he's at, and we're going to talk about all about him, which would be fun for, well, him. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> Robert, how are you? Welcome to the show. I, I, I'm good. Now, now I got to jump on something right away. Uh, we're not the little wrenches, as in like the tool that you fix your car with. We're the little wretches, as in Les Miserables, Victor Hugo, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist. You know, the, the little wretches. You know, as in wretched of the earth, as in blessed are the meek, and so on. Oh, very nice. That tells me then that not only are you a singer songwriter, you're also an educated man. I have, uh, I'm like a sponge for useless knowledge. I don't know. You know, it just sticks to me. And because the world makes no sense to me whatsoever. I have really, I think, well, why do I have a good memory? Because nothing makes any sense to me. So I suck it all in and then try to make sense of it. So I need a lot of alone time to try to make sense of all this crazy stuff that I picked up. Because there's a lot of crazy stuff that is going on around the world right now, and uh, and it's some of that stuff I just as soon forget. But you know, it's hard to do. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I've I've always gone around with, you know, especially when I was younger, I had this feeling that everybody knows something that I don't know because all of this is okay with them, and and I'm pretty sure we could do better. So uh, at one point. I, you know, I was just reading. I would, there, were, there were these bookstores that had discount books, and I would go in there and I'd buy all the classic literature and try to read at least one book a week, see one play a week, and, you know, try to figure out what it is that I'm missing that everybody else knows. And, uh, you know. Did you ever understand. figure it out? You know, yeah, I think I think I've got a pretty good grip on things, but that's something everybody, each person has to do for his or herself. You know, there's no shortcuts. Well, that's true. But I, I would submit to tell you that because you are looking for more and trying to figure out how it's all working, that that there are a lot of people who just don't go there. They just assume, you know, they're going to go to work. They're going to take care of their family. They're going to do this and that, but they're not going to try and figure out you know, why are things not going as well as they could be going and how can I make a difference to make them better? Yeah. Yeah. What would you ever come across that? The, the scientist, he's on all kinds of YouTube videos, Michio Kaku. He's like a string theory guy. And he, you know, they want to find the unified theory of everything. Sort of like what Einstein was, was searching for the, the, the one little equation that's about an inch and a half long that explains the entire universe. Uh, you know, but you know, that, that search, it, it, it all is to, like I, from your intro, you know, it's all one. Uh, I want to understand as best as I can, how, how, how it all works and how I'm part of it. Exactly. Well, well, from my, my perspective, we are all one energy. We are all come from the same place. We all are working together. We are made from the same substance. We're all after the same things on a basic level. And we all need to understand that we need to give people space to be who they are so that we can be who we are. Yeah. yeah. So I'll get off my soapbox now because we're going to talk about you. Uh, <laughs> you've been a singer songwriter for a long time. Tell us about your background. Well, you know, when I was a kid, I, you know, I don't know. Somebody asked me recently, you know, how did you get into music? I said, well, like there's the spark, there's the flame, and then there's the raging fire. You know, I don't know where the spark was. Like when I was a kid, uh, 
you know, we didn't have babysitters and daycare. You know, we went to our cousin's house. Or then we went to our grandmother's house. And everywhere we went in my extended family, the kids always had a, a little children's turntable and a box of scratchy records. And we were always playing music. You know, we weren't allowed to touch our parents' records because, you know, you had to wash your hands and ask for somebody to put those on. But, uh, you know, we we're always listening to music. And if we'd be at a birthday party, we'd get tennis rackets or badminton rackets and pretend that we're, you know, play, playing playing along and we're performing. Uh, my my uh, my dad was remodeling our basement. and uh, My cousins and I tried to make guitars out of scrap plywood and two by fours and nails and rubber bands. And, uh, you know, I just always felt a lot of joy when I was around music. And then at a certain point, you know, I think probably maybe around 14, 15 years old, you know, I know you, you want to stay away from the negativity, but, you know, I decided I hated everything. And the only thing I didn't hate music, you know, that was like my lifeline uh, to keep me going. And I only wanted to play in a band, write songs and play in a band. But to play in a band, you got to get along with people. And I was like, oh, that's, that's never going to happen because I hate everybody. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to have to be a writer, you know. And so I went, went to the University of Pittsburgh, which has a very strong writing program. But for me, it was just, I'm just treading water. I'm going to the university to tread water until I can figure out how to do this band thing. And then as fate would have it, my roommate was a really powerful musician. And it's like, oh, that's good. You sing, I write. So we're going to start a band. And, and then the thing that really drove it home, two, two things kind of happened concurrently. One, I got a rare form of cancer that would have been considered fatal most of the time had I not been lucky enough to find doctors who were on the cutting edge of the research and got me on this experimental chemotherapy regimen that worked. And punk rock happened. So I was like, okay, I do not want to face eternity not having done the one thing that the only thing I really wanted to do, and I didn't even do it, I better start a band. And then punk rock made it possible for people with no experience, just nothing but a lot of energy to, to do it. Uh, you know, and I don't know what you think of punk rock. Generally, people think of hairstyles and, and noisy guitars. But it was really uh, just kind of an open, open table. You could do anything. Uh, you just had to want to do it real bad. And, and, that gave, and that was a couple of years of treading water to figure out, okay, I'm, I am good at writing, and I like to write songs. So now I have to learn the art of songwriting. And, uh, you know, and the stories that I have to tell are not the ordinary stories. Uh, I've lived through things that other people, you know, have never had to deal with. So what I have to say might not be everybody's cup of tea. But, you know, if you respect the audience, the audience can handle anything. They can see really uh, tough, tough, heart, heart-rending movies. Uh, well, if you're going to do that in a song, which is so much more powerful and personal you got to find a way to set it up so that people can can take it. You know, you don't want to be hitting people over the head with a sledgehammer, but they can handle anything if you put it in the right context. So that's that's sort of what I've gotten good at o over the years is, you know, I'm a writer, I, I teach, and I teach through songs. You know, I tell stories through songs, I teach through stories, uh, and I think that's the most powerful way to make a connection. And, you know, I don't want to be preaching to the converted. I want, don't want to be talking to people who already agree with me, who already know what I know. So I'm always going to be a little on the outs because I'm trying to, you know, reach people who aren't necessarily in the music world, you know. Uh, oh, exactly. That make any sense? Oh, absolutely. But who are your influences growing up? Who, who was your favorite band when you're, you and your cousins were sitting around with a scratchy uh, record player? Oh, well... Okay. Well, well, we liked all kind everything, uh, stuff that you know people probably don't even know about now. Uh, there was a record by the Mills Brothers. Uh, there were records by Ed Ames. Uh, you know, all all across the map. Of course, my cousin, who was a little older than me, told me that the Beatles were the best band because they wrote their own songs. And so, okay, well, then we're writing songs immediately. You know, and. Uh, then the adults would joke, oh, well, you need to get a recording contract. Well, how do you get a recording contract? Well, you have to contact the record companies. We would get the records and we would look at the address on the inner sleeve. We'd write down the addresses and write letters to the record companies asking for a recording contract. We never got an answer, which is kind of rude, I think. They should have at least, you know. Said hello. Yeah. So you guys, you know, keep trying. 
but uh, but that's that's for for me it was the Beatles, and then when I got a little uh, further along, uh, you know, I, I the 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 rock poets, you know, Patti Smith, Lou Reed, Bob Dylan, uh, Sam Shepard as as a like a poet dr dramatist. You know, I'm from Pittsburgh, so I'm really big on August Wilson, who's not a you know not a songwriter, but a, a real poet. Uh, who again, you know, poetry is a cottage industry for college professors. So you put it on the stage in a play, and you know, with a little bit of dramatic conflict, and and, and you know, it comes alive in a in a really magical way. And I found out that uh, August Wilson, and, and when I was at Pitt, I did a an independent study with a guy named Rob Penny, who started Black Horizons Theater with August Wilson. And Rob Penny, August Wilson, and that whole generation of black writers in Pittsburgh, it, I don't know if it's, it's just like this magical convergence where they just stopped going to school. And instead of going to school, they went to the library. Like Rob Penny became the head of the black studies department at the University of Pittsburgh by going to the Carnegie Library and reading every book about Africa. You know, August Wilson would, you know, not go to school, when it was time to go to school, he'd get up and leave the house like he was going to school. He'd go around with his little notebook and his, his pencil and jot down what he saw, what he heard, what he eavesdropped on. And uh, that's, you know, that's a big part of what I do is trying to capture the, the, the life through, through the word, you know, overhearing the voices. I, I used to have like a almost like a tape machine memory where I could eavesdrop on a conversation and remember it word for word, like, like music. I've lost it. I can't do it anymore. My 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 son can still do that. It, it's infuriating. I'll make a quote from a movie, and then he will, uh, uh, <sighs> he will do it actually verbatim, word for word. And it's like, oh, that just sucks. I wish I could do that. <laughs> anyway, but it's 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 great to talk to you because we've got a couple of the songs that we want to play, and uh, you've been you've been busy doing this for a very long time. Uh, how's COVID treating you? I've been talking to some other folks, and COVID has been a bit of a problem for for you guys getting out and and uh, and playing music, huh? Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the first thing way it affected me is is that I had a, a little tour booked for the Pacific Northwest uh, last March, and then last March everything shut down, and they, I remember the emails coming in. Uh, venue has to cancel the show. Venue has to cancel the show because nothing was going to make me quit. Uh, and I'd be saying, oh, I'm flying out there. I'm going to borrow a guitar for, from a friend in Boise, and then I'm going to rent a car. And it was like, you're going to get in a plane. You got more guts than I got. And then, of course, you couldn't take a plane either. So, you know, but but it leveled the playing field. I know we're all just needles in a haystack right now. There, there's a million things out there, but people who are looking for things have a way of finding them. Uh, it gave me a chance to get my entire, well, not my entire catalog, but a lot of my catalog, you know, distributed uh, by The Orchard, which is a subsidiary of Sony. So a lot of my stuff is accessible. And then, you know, said, okay, I got to hire a publicist. Uh, I've got this lifelong catalog of work, which is really good. People spoke very highly of it, perhaps to the point that they'd be embarrassed of what they said, given how obscure I turned out to be. But then, you know, with the help of Michael Stover, who you mentioned, uh, it's connecting with people. We got on about 115 radio stations. We had the not the one song I think you're going to play, The Ballad of Johnny Blowtorch, which is not a folk rock song, but it was the number one song on the iTunes folk rock chart in South Africa for a period. I'm like, oh, man. So, you know, there's people out there finding it. Uh, well, and, and that, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, hey, if nobody can tour, then, you know, that's cool. I'm on I'm on I'm on the same playing field as Garth Brooks at this point. You know? <laughs> That's that's true. Well, the problem is, is in your industry, like my industry with podcasting and stuff, breaking through the noise, you got to you got to find it's hard to break through the noise because there's so many people trying to do the same exact thing you're doing. Yeah, well, you know, like I don't even know what a podcast was. It was probably, you know, 15 years ago when somebody suggested I, I was doing a little concert series of acoustic songwriters in uh, the Pittsburgh area, and uh, we called it the Three Penny Opry. And somebody got the idea that we ought to record all the shows and that we ought to do a podcast. Like, 
that sounds good. But I don't even know what a podcast is. And now by the time I get to understand what a podcast is, there's a thousand of them. Uh, but you just got to do it. You know, you put in the work and you know, as they say, put your shoulder to the plow. Don't look back. You never know what's going to happen. That's it. And there, there are actually 500,000 active podcasts out there, but they're wow. just, but there are almost as many musicians that are trying to find the same play that, that, that you are. So. Well, well, like when I started to, to go into a professional recording studio was like an act of faith uh, right. to book a gig out of town, to, to, to work and make enough money to press a record. Those were those all took commitment. And so you were treated with respect, like you put yourself in another league by making a record. Now, you know, any kid with a laptop can make a record that sounds like a Grammy Award winner. You know, any 12 year old in his bedroom could do it. Um, that's that's so true. I know there's a band up here that uh, signed a record contract uh, 20 years ago, and with it with and they got money up front from the uh, um, from the record company, and they are still paying it off. Oh well, you know, so, own your own stuff, man. You know, cut out the middle, man. That's it. That's it. And th that's what I really like about the technology now is that you can, if you've got a dream, if you've got a vision, if you've got something to make it work, you can make it work without it costing you, you know, like your left arm. You, it it yeah. can be okay. Yeah. You know, and, and you can get lost. Like, you know, I've been in this for a while. So I've picked up the language of marketing and I've, you know, picked up a little bit of the language of sales and, you know, but I'm not a brand. You know, and, 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 you know, my stories, I get it. They're a commodity. I'm trying to sell them. But, you know, when people ask me about, you know, your fans, like, man, my fans are my friends. You know, if you're connecting with this, you mean my, my stuff, I go, this means something to you and you mean something to me that goes beyond. You're not just uh, a paying customer. I don't, you know, I don't even want to think about that stuff. Uh, when people talk about like the music business, like, I'm, I get it that I'm in the music business, but that side of it means absolutely nothing to me. But I'm in the communication business. I'm in the soul business. You know, uh, where do I fit in? I fit in an eternity, man. I, I'm not. I'm not worried about all that other stuff. Good for you. That's 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 the proper attitude to have. It truly is. Um, let's play. Which song would you like to play first? Ugh. Well, uh, probably the ballad of Johnny Blowtorch because then. It, it'll get this thing out of its system. And then if you play all of my friends later, it'll be more of a soothing thing. Then this will be the divider and the other thing will be the uniter. There you go. There you go. This is, <laughs> I love the name. Where'd you come up with the name? Oh, uh, well, I read, uh, there's a book called carburetor dung. It's the collection of, uh, reviews written by a rock critic named Lester Bangs, who's a very literary rock critic. And he wrote a review of uh, Iggy Pop called, you know, Iggy Pop, Blowtorch in Bondage. And the roommate that I mentioned earlier, my college roommate, his name was John Creighton. Uh, I, I wanted to, after John passed away, I wanted to gather all the anecdotes that we had about him because he, he was like this firebrand, just organic, not a showman, but just like a torch when you turned him on. So I kind of came up with that Iggy, Iggy Pop blowtorch and bondage. So I started to refer to John Creighton as Johnny Blowtorch. And uh, it, 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 I don't want to give away the song too much, but I, I remember one time running into John and his clothes were falling off. He was skinny as can be. He, he was the most powerful musician, but he had the, the humiliation of having to take a job. And uh, he just was not cut out to work. And he was always so busy and falling behind, he didn't have time to eat. So instead of eating, he would take Tums to settle his stomach. And for body aches and fatigue, he would take aspirin, which would then mean that he would have to take more Tums. And he, he had this thing, uh, his little slogan was, I will endure all of the necessary havoc for the single clear moment. And it's like, oh, well, man, you're going to go through all this torture. You're going to go through the eye of the hurricane. And if, in fact, you find that single clear moment, we're all going to be jealous of you. So like the refrain of my song is, if I ever get lucky and score, you'll want to be me. 
but it's basically a description of this crazy, crazy, uh, you know, raggedy blowtorch of a person, you know, who I loved. Very nice. And uh, did you mention that he has passed now? Oh, he died a long time ago. Oh. Uh, but probably the the song, which is like the cornerstone of the Little Wretches catalog, is a song called, song called Born with a Gift, which is kind of also inspired by John Creighton. You know, because it was, it was like this, not, I'm not alone. Anybody who knew him would tell you that he was the most talented person we ever met. But when he died, he just had a handful of recordings, a couple of notebooks. I inherited his, his vinyl collection. But, you know, how could a guy with such profound talent leave not so little behind? But the, what he left behind was his impact on people like me, you know, who carry it forward. Um, that's know. that's that's really cool. That's Because really, if you have a legacy, that's the best legacy to leave is to have other people doing what you were doing and they you inspired them to do it. And uh, which is really, which is really pretty cool. So uh, this is uh, Robert Andrew Wagner. And the song is the ballad of Johnny Blowtorch. Showing and when you last slept in a bed, there's no knowing Your eating garbage, your complexion is spotty And your chiseled physique now hangs up over your body Your barrel's empty and you're scraping the bottom And the thing that you're looking for, nobody's got it Here comes a face from your past, don't pretend you don't see me Get lucky and scar, you wanna be me And that is Robert Andrew Wagner. And that is, I'm going to blow it. I know I am. I'm going to try it, but I'm going to blow it. The Little Wretches. There you go. Now, oh. because the one picture that you used, which I picked up off of a table, somebody sketched that while we were playing, but it says Little Wenches Rock. And <laughs> and I and, and the guy who did it, I never, I don't know what became of him, but uh, he was a really talented artist uh, in Pittsburgh named Rick Bach, who did like sculpture and stuff. I don't, who knows whatever became a Rick Bach, but I, I, I might use that little doodle for a future album cover. That's a, that's, that's, it was a cool little doodle. I like, I like that. Yeah. You know, so that, that, that was great. Now you're, you've had several incarnations of the little wretches, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, when I first started the band, it was me and my brother who played violin and uh, we, we did 
songs that I wrote. I mean, I always kind of thought of what I did as, as a form of folk music. I mean, I think punk rock is, a, is an authentic form of folk music. I think hip hop music is an authentic form of folk music. And much of this acoustic pop music that we hear that is called folk music, that's not really folk. Folk is something that, you know, you, you learn from your culture and you pass on to somebody. And, you know, the, the whole commerce thing kind of destroys the, the concept of, of folk music. But my, my brother and I, we learned a bunch of old folk songs that I learned out of a book in the library. We did some, you know, Rock Island Line, which people know. It, it's really traditional. It's credited to Lead Belly. Johnny Cash had a big hit version of it. Uh, you know, we, weird little songs like Pete Bog Soldiers, which was sung in the concentration camps in, you know, by... You know, it, there, there was actually like the model concentration camp where they had the Jewish prisoners put on shows and Pete Bog Soldiers was a song from their shows. So so we that I'm thinking, OK, I got to find a way how to get my kind of hardcore thing across uh, in context. So I thought pairing it with uh, folk music was the way to go. And then I had a couple of friends, including J Johnny Blowtorch, John Creighton, and they were like the pips from Gladys Knight. They'd be snapping their fingers and clapping their hands and banging pots and pans and doing like doo-wop vocals in the background. And it was really acoustic, uh, not very loud, but, uh, you know, people liked us, but we wanted to get bigger. And how do you get bigger? You know, you get louder. Because how, how, with this weird little thing we were doing, where could we play except for like theater openings and private parties? And, you know, we wanted to be rock stars. So, you know, we got louder. But in the process of getting louder, you also get more mainstream and more just like everybody else. Uh, so, yeah, we've gone, gone through a lot of phases. And the weird thing, you know, how, how you know, the universe works, uh, you know, every time that we were on like the cusp of like breaking through to the next level something weird would happen somebody's mother would die or the bass player would get pregnant or you know there's some be some cataclysmic event that would keep us from uh you know going on to the next level you know but we we had our chances uh, in, in in getting into that commercial world i mean you know, i had dinner with a record company president you know who, you know asked me if i wanted to be a rock star and I must answer the question wrong, you know. I said, no, I really, hardly really just want a couple hundred people in every city in the world that want to hear me, you know. Uh, you know what's what's stardom, you know? Aren't we yeah. all already stars? But so anyhow, either way, uh, that that coveted brass ring that everybody wants. Everybody's so hungry for fame because they're afraid of dying, you know. Uh, fame is nothing. I mean, wouldn't it be the worst thing in the world to be famous but misunderstood? Like oh, yeah. you remember it for something that's completely antithetical to what you were trying to accomplish and what you believed in. Uh, so, and, and, you know, let's face it, a hundred years, hardly any of us are going to be remembered at all. Or we <laughs> remember Bob Dylan. <laughs> Funny. You should mention that because we were talking in the last hour with uh, a gentleman and we were, and we were talking about with John Madonna and we were talking about, you know, all the folks that, like like the Jim Croce's of the world and the and the uh, uh, Ricky Nelsons of the world and the, a lot of guys that have said have passed on now and people don't remember who they are they remember some of the music their music stays but the names and who they are tends to tends to disappear like and even you know in in like Bob Hope um, my kids oh, have no man. idea who Bob Hope is and yeah, yeah. And, and so it, we go away but it's cool that you have an art form and a style of music that will stay and that people will love years from now. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny, you know, even listening to the song that you just played, you know, 99 out of 100 times when I play that song, I play it solo with an acoustic guitar. And, you know, when I'm listening to it, wow, that sounds so ferocious. Uh, but that same song, I can play it solo with an acoustic guitar, and it's just as kind of riveting, you know, especially in the context of somebody sitting there playing, you got a friend, ling, ling, ding, ding, ding. And then I come out with, you know. Well, Kayla, what'd you think of that song? I liked it. Very upbeat. Move, like, you could dance to it. I was bebopping to it. 
Yeah. Well, well, you know what I'm afraid that people like about it, though, you know, because it does have that energy. You know, that's what pe people generally they respond to that energy. And it has like an attitude about it, too. Uh, but I, I mean, I don't want to hijack this interview, Kevin, but you may. Uh, like the op opening line of the song is all you ever wanted was to hang on a cross. Now, there, there are artists who've made a living by blending the profane with the sacred you know prince made a career of it patty smith you know the the poetess of rock and roll uh her most famous song starts off with jesus died for somebody's sins but not mine so so i think you know the, the, you're you're really playing with fire when you when you get into that because people you know they, they buy into that rebellion side of it and you know, I, I just know from having talked to a few people who told me they like the song that, you know, they get into that kind of anti-authority, you know, because religion is authority and I'm against organized religion. Well, yeah, be against whatever. I don't care what you're against. What are you for? You know, tell me what you're for, brother. And uh, most most people can't articulate that. So that, that's that's what I, I'm worried about with that song a little bit is it's edgy. Uh, it's got a little nastiness to it but it's, it's a piece in a much larger building. And if, and if it, you could, well, it is what it is, you know, I, I can't take it back, but it's part of, it's part of something bigger. Well, see, that's one of those songs though, that you might find that out of the blue, it, because uh, it's catchy, it's, it's fast paced a lot. By the way, I was thinking of Madonna too, also that is rather, yeah, yeah. rather sacrilegious, but um but it has got a beat to it, it and it may catch on. You don't know, honestly don't know which one's going to be the one to, to catch on. And if that is, you, you'll have to embrace it. <laughs> and say, Man, that was awesome. We did great with that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it may not want to, but, but, in, in, but, you know, you, but you are so versatile in what you've done and uh, um, you, you really want to put a lot of, um, your heart, your soul, and a positive message out there, don't you? Yeah, yeah well, you know, one, one of the things I always come back to, you know, it, like everybody else, one of the things that happened to me in the past year, I spent an awful lot of time looking at social media, you know. Uh, the, And you would think from what you, you see and what you hear, the, you know, we, we're living in really highly divided times. And like, well, the data of my actual daily life does not corroborate that. You know, I see humor. I see people making the best of situations, trying to find a way to get along. Uh, and, oh, yeah, that's because you live in a peaceful little leave at the beaver world. It's like, no, I don't. I live in the world that I make. You know, I surround myself with beauty and I look for the positive. Uh, and and I'm always trying to look for common ground with people. You know, that that's, again, I... I you can unite around what you're against, but then once you have eliminated your foe, then you got to decide what's holding you together. And it's like, oh, we were united in our opposition to something else. There's nothing else holding us together. We got to unite around what we're for. You know, are we for love? Uh, and if we're for love, then what does that mean? Uh, how do we communicate with you? How do we respect each other? Um, you know, that's. You know, this is really so easy. It's so easy. I mean, because in real life, people do it. Uh See, and that's why I like to have people like you on, because the tagline of my podcast is uh, declaring our freedom from hate, division and fear. I think we can all do that. We don't need to be fearful of one another. We don't need to hate one another. We're all equal. We're all the same. We're all one. And we should we need to start talking about it in those in that context rather than being divisive and and. Uh, being ter uh, tribal and territorial and this is mine and the hell with you and stuff like that. And, and you're right. You can, pr you can be in a, in a situation where you are living with people that, and associating yourself with people who are positive and, and have the same kind of mindset that you do. You don't have to succumb to the other side, if you will. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Well, and, and I think the other thing too, uh, well, when I was in graduate school, I did this little study uh, research project on on how, like in a social setting, 
the dominant personality, if they have a particular speech pattern, the other people in the group will fall into that speech pattern. I was thinking of a particularly charismatic guy I knew who had an Irish accent. And I would notice that when people were in his presence, they would start talking like an Irishman. Like, oh, give me a break, you know. But so I wanted to examine if that happens. And I don't know if my results were conclusive or not. But I think, you know, you have the, the ability to set the tone for the group that you're in. Uh, uh, you know, even like with, with things like for school children, back in the old program, they used to have just say no to drugs. Right. You know, they'd say, well, you can't just say no, you have to provide an alternative. So if one, they would teach, train the kids, if one of your kids suggests doing something that you know is wrong, have her two, two or three options always in your back pocket. Like, oh, that sounds like fun, but why don't we go over to my grandmother's house and shoot baskets? You know, ha have the alternative suggestion in your pocket so that the other people in the group have a choice. We can do that, which we know is wrong, or we can do that, which we know is fun. Let's go with the fun. Uh, you know, so, so, you know, I, I think, I think if you're, uh, when they say nature deplores a vacuum, is the glass half empty or half full? The glass is always full of something, you know, we're the ones who can fill it. Uh, and, and you know, you have to actively fill it with, with, with good because whatever you don't feel with good, bad will just sneak its way in there. It will. It will. I, I appreciate the, 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 the way that you live your life and the way you, that you approach life. Which is which is which is really cool. Um, you've been doing this for a long time. Do you feel like you're just getting started? Yeah, well, especially from the folk music side of it, because you know I I've, I've been I've written a lot that hasn't come out yet, uh, and, and again that's that's you know things opportunity presents itself to you when you're ready to take advantage of it. So. What I consider, I mean, there, there's, there are songs that I've been performing live for a decade that have yet to be recorded and released that, you know, I, I think makes the Ballad of Johnny Blowtorch sound embarrassing. You know, uh, I, I've got I've got some some good stuff and and more to go. And it, but I just want to do the work. Do I, as you know? I don't want to fall back into shtick, but you know, I always remind people: just put in the work. Don't. If you do the work, good things might happen. If you don't do the work, guaranteed, good things won't happen. So do the work and don't worry about it. Everything else will take care of itself. Exactly. I'm reminded of a of a Hall and Oates song that uh, they did that that uh, they released. And they released as a single, didn't do anything. It was on an album, uh, their first album, I believe. And then they released two other albums. And Sarah Smiles hit. Wow. Sarah Smile hit. And then people started looking at the catalog. And the song She's Gone became a big hit. And that was had been released three years before. So you don't know when it's going to be that somebody's hey. going to discover your work. Hey, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, but I live in the Pittsburgh area now. And until recently, the luncheonette that was the abandoned luncheonette, which was one of the Hall and Oates albums, was right along Route 724. And people who were in the know, if you're driving by, say, see that, see that? That's the Hall and Oates album cover. I'm like, oh, wow. I guess Hall and Oates were like Temple University guys. Uh, <laughs> from right. So that, you know, some people around here love, Hall. I like Hall and Oates. I mean, when, when I w wanted to learn the art of songwriting, you know, when I was a punker and thinking, man, I, I, Hall and Oates is one of the first bands I turned to, you know, there's, okay, how do they do it? Uh, Batula Clark. Uh, you know, Downtown. Yeah. You know, I, I, I got an album by Tony Bennett, Songs for the Jet Set. Uh, Can Charlie you Chapman. Know? Can you believe he's 90 years old and still out there singing? I, I used to prefer him to Frank Sinatra, but uh, I've come to, it was hard for me to appreciate Sinatra, but out here in the Philly area, they're, the, they're, they're playing, they're recasting, they're rebroadcasting these shows that were done. A guy did a, a Sunday Frank Sinatra show for like decades. And now that the DJ is not here, they're still rebroadcasting his shows. 
and you know you turn on the radio in philly on sunday and you hear all the sinatra stuff it's like oh I, now i know why he was so highly esteemed he really uh the timing the phrasing the orchestration which you know wasn't his but probably wouldn't happen without his stamp of approval um Oh, exactly. Well, there's so many really good, good folks that are out there. I think you're one of them, and uh, it's just breaking through the noise. Yeah, well, that's uh... what noise? What noise? <laughs> <laughs> there are just so many, just so many. Why don't we play all of our, all of my friends, and uh, we, then you can tell me about that after we play it. What do you think? All right, that sounds good. Okay, so this is this is like going to be a different than the last song. Um, and, uh, but it, this, they're, this, they're both really good in their own rights. Um, uh, they're different genres, but I think I like this one as well. So all of my friends, this is, uh, Robert Andrew Wagner from the little wretches. I got it. Turned into fanatics With terrible secrets hidden up in their attics Closets full of skeletons and old bones They only bring out to play with when nobody's home All of my friends are on some kind of list of Undesirables and atticists It's not even safe to admit that you're one of our friends All of my friends know cause and effect They're notably known for abuse and neglect We're natural targets, we're perfect to blame None of my friends ever runs out of shame All of my friends are taking some kind of rap But your biggest weapon is your handicap Nothing much good ever happens to none of my friends Walking in circles, living alone We're stuck in a ditch, but I'm a believer I don't know much of death right from wrong Oh, what comedy Oh, what torture Oh, what stories we will tell Someday, someday Walking in grace, we're marching like sheep to the slaughterhouse blade. We're the prize winning herd at the Macy's parade. None of my friends ever made the first team. If you're going to hell, gotta go to extremes. Gently down the stream, go oh, none of my friends. Vanguard of vultures. Rarified air With the high priest of culture We kneel down for a prayer For the lesbian couples And their turkey basters And the amateur A connoisseur The cyanide tasters All of my friends The wind scattered and blown Get too close To the foot of the throne But they're the best people I've ever known Carving a niche between the dust and the ether Walking in circles, living alone Stuck in a ditch, but I'm a believer I don't know much except right from wrong Oh, what comedy Oh, what torture
that was just wonderful. <laughs> that was that was really really good. I I enjoyed that song as well. By the way, this is Robert Andrew Wagner, and that song is all of my friends. But I got to ask you, who's the young lady? Oh my, that, that's Rosa Colucci. Uh, Rosa, when I first th th there was this time when, when like nothing was happening with the band, and I kind of thought, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to every musical mecca in the United States, you know, Kansas City, St. Louis, New Orleans, Nashville, Memphis, you know, spent six months or a year and a half or however long in each city. And I ended up out in San Francisco and realized I was going to go back to Pittsburgh for a little while. And while I was in Pittsburgh, you know, might as well play. So I put an ad in a little newspaper uh, in Pittsburgh looking for a singer. You know, I want to do that like kind of harmony, you know, Johnny Cash with uh, his wife, uh, you know, Graham Parsons and Emmy Lou Harris, Bob Bill and Joan Baez. So I put an ad in and uh, Rosa answered the ad and it turned out she'd gone to high school with my little brother, you know, who I originally, it's now, now my brother had passed away by that. But when I'm showing her my press clippings, she says, I know this person. That's Chuck Wagner. So I go, that's, yeah, Chuck Wagner's my brother. So I went to high school with, with Chuck Wagner. So I felt like I'd known her all my life. And her official job description was to make me sound better. You know, I don't think anybody's ever going to pay to hear me sing, but I can write a little bit, you know, and I have this thing, you know. So her, her job was to make me sound better. And if Rosa was only good at one thing, she would be world famous. And if the world was coming to the end and only one person could save it, uh, she would be the person you would turn to. Uh, you know, she's a ph phenomenally talented person who's good at too many things. Uh, in fact, we're recording uh, an album right now uh, and we started working on it back in January. And one of the things that we're waiting to do is to get her to sing. Uh, so every time I go back to Pittsburgh, I stay at her place, you know, it's like, okay, we're going to work on this music. The recording studio is like 12 minutes from, from her home, but uh, she can sing. I mean, she's a difference maker, you know, but uh, she hasn't put her, her magic touch on the, on the recording yet. And uh, I just gotta, I just gotta be patient, you know, because when she, because I could, I could go in and finish it tomorrow without her, and it just won't, you know, that magic will be missing. She, she, she is a catalyst. She, she makes something. She adds a lot. She adds a lot to it. So she, she is, she's a, uh, um, master of many trades and does a lot of different things and can't focus. Uh, oh, well, she can focus. Uh, th there's a, oh man, there's so many stories I could tell you about her, but they're really her story, story to tell. I have a few songs about her. In fact, on, on the album, Undesirables and Anarchist, she sings lead on a so song called Running, uh, which I wrote specifically for her. She asked me to write a song for her. And because uh, she left home when she was 15 years old. She never graduated from high school, but she, she graduated number two in her class at Port, Point Park University. And Point Park has like a music conservatory. And she applied, she auditioned to get in. And everybody wanted to know, you know, you're older you know, this is, this is for kids. You know, you're, you're going to, you're, you want to be singing on Broadway. You want to be singing in opera. You're too old for that, 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 that boat sailed, uh, but your voice is so good. So they couldn't not let her in the program. Uh, so, you know, so she became, you know, classically trained and singing that opera stuff, but uh, she's, uh, she's great with color. She, she, you know, she does color designs for people's houses. Uh, if, if you were on your deathbed and needed somebody to wipe your face, she would be at your bedside wiping your face. Uh, uh, you know, so she's good at a lot of things. At, at one point, she she was working for the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, booking the travel for their sports writers during the Olympics. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, she could do anything. Um, so, oh, but if she's just would have just sung with me. <laughs> I'm not going to do anything else, you know, but yeah. She'd be rich and famous now. Uh, I'd be rich and famous. That, 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 <laughs> that would also help. Yeah, that, that would be good. Robert Andrew Wagner has been our guest, and he is, would I call you the leader of the Little Wretches? 
Yeah, I'm cool? the little wretch, man. I'm the founder. You know that that you know. Let's get yeah. back to the marketing thing. Is that's that's my brand. I started the band. Uh, you know, we have this body of work, cuts across genres. We have like the punky sound and stuff. We have folky sounding stuff. We have you know narrative storytelling stuff. We have you know more expressionist or impressionist uh, lyrical stuff. Oh, so we're all we're across the map. If you listen to our catalog of stuff, you'll be stunned at how much how much ground we cover. But I'm the guy, you know. I started it. I've kept it going. Uh, there are a few other really good songwriters that have been part of the band. There's a guy, Dave Losey. Uh, he's another another one that if you're as good as Dave Losey and not playing in a band, it just wouldn't make any sense. But as far as I know, he's not playing right now. Ellen Hildebrand, who put an out an album of her own last year, uh, phenomenal. I mean, some people said, "Oh, she was the soul of the Little Wretches." Like, yeah, well, you know, we'll, we'll have to pick up additional soul as we roll along because we're rolling along without her right now. You, know? you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Kayla, do you have any thoughts? Any questions? I'm extremely intrigued at this. I enjoy the music that you play and I think you're going to continue to strive and succeed. So uh, you're a blessing. Thank you for sharing your music. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. I was listening to some of the earlier episodes of, of the show. Uh, so I said, Oh yeah, this is, this is right up my alley here. Which right. is what Michael told Michael told me this guy's right up your alley. You're, you're, you're made for this show. <laughs> Well, I appreciate having you here, and you're welcome back any darn time you want to. When you go for your first Grammy, you're obviously are going to be welcome back. Um, but anytime, anytime you want to come, and we can talk about any number of things because you're you're a very educated man, and you're self educated, and you've got uh, some some great opinions about life and how to how to carry it on. You should maybe you should put that some into some of your music. I'm just kidding. You do that all the yeah, time. Yeah, I try. Uh, yeah, you do great. By the way, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, Robert, how do they do it? Well, you know, we're everywhere. Uh, best way is just our website, littlewretches.com. Uh, look me up on Facebook. Um, you know, it, it, if you want the music, you can get anywhere. Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, wherever you stream music, we're all over the place. There's tons of live stuff up at YouTube. Uh, but the best way, just uh, go, go to our website, littlewretches.com. Is that where you got all those cool pictures of us, or did you get those? Yes. From Michael? Well, actually, Michael is is very very helpful because he's got you know, for he's got uh, press kits for all you guys. So yeah. I've got all your music, he 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 he, and I've got uh, uh, the the your bio and the whole thing. So he makes it very easy for me to talk with you guys. But uh, it's 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 just such a it's such a pleasure for me because I don't understand it. It's to me, it's like it's like a um, UFO. I don't know how you do it or where it is, or how, but it's just amazing that you can write songs and you can play as well as you do and do what you do. It, it's to me, it's just otherworldly. And so I just love what you guys do. And so I just want to support it. So, by the way, go to his website, which is uh, littlewretches.com and buy his music. Be still my yeah. foolish heart. Buy the CD. Don't stream it. Or if you want to download it, you can do that as well. But uh, these artists are working their their behinds off to try and make it all work, and they need to, they deserve to be paid for their work, don't you think? Yeah, I I, I wouldn't mind being paid for it. I you know I like money, but you know, look, I'd be doing this no matter what. And in fact, you know, I'm sure we're, we're at the end of the road here, but. Uh, one of the books I came across when I was in college was, uh, I think it was called Strange Days Ahead by a beat poet named Michael Brownstein. And he had an essay at the end of the book where he said that poetry is the only art form capable of speaking the truth because it has no economic value. And because it has no economic value, it cannot be corrupted. Like, ah, yeah. So the blessing of uh, being outside of the world of commerce is, you know, you, you are free to speak the truth. And if you don't speak the truth, you have nobody but to, to blame but yourself. That is so profound because you're right. You're mm -hmm. right. And uh, that's that's why I don't do corporate radio uh, because of that. You get told what to say, how to say it, when to say it and when to take a commercial break. And I want to do that. I like to do I like to do this much better. So I enjoy I enjoy their time together. Robert, will you come back sometime? Oh, love to, love to, anytime. 
Uh, I won't waste your time. I'll wait till I have something else profound to push upon you. Uh, more <laughs> branding, more product. Exactly. Well, you know, but but what I'm interested in is your passion. And your passion shines through like a beacon because you're passionate about what you do. It uh, You're not getting paid a lot of money to do it at the moment. Hopefully that'll change. But regardless of that, you do it because you're passionate about doing it. And that's if everybody did that, there would be nobody would have any time for hate, for war, for division and fear. Everybody would be too busy doing shit that they love to do. Amen. So that's 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 the goal. And that's why having people like you on is important, because people can see that and go, you know, I'm maybe I'll pick up that guitar that's sitting in the corner that I haven't touched in three weeks or a month or a year or five years and and, and see what I can do with it. And then get passionate about it. So is there anything, by the way, that you would like to add? Anything you'd like to say to the audience before we go? Oh, my. Uh, well, I've, I've rambled, I think, a little bit. You guys let me let me off a leash. Uh, <laughs> That's what it's all about, my friend. Yeah, but, but uh, you know, hey, hey if you're going to give me a couple more minutes, I'd, I'd say I went to this, like, uh, seminar back in my hometown of Pittsburgh uh, where it was called, like, Finding Your Purpose. And one of the things they said, you know, a hint, if you're born with a purpose, your creator certainly wouldn't keep it a mystery from you. Among the hints that you're doing the right thing is you get so into it that you forget to get hungry and you forget to get tired. I mean, you just light up when you're doing this. That That's one hint. And uh, he suggested that, you know, just like a corporation has a mission statement and a vision statement, you know, wouldn't be a bad idea for us. So, so for me as an artist, my mission statement and vision statement kind of come from two of my favorite songwriters. Lou Reed of the Velvet Underground has a song called I'll Be Your Mirror. And his just a line, I'll be your mirror, reflect what you are in case you don't know. So that's that's what I'm trying to do. Reflect what you are in case you don't know. What you do, you look in the mirror. Oh, I've got a little dirt on my face. What you do with that reflection is up to you, but I'm trying to show you through my lens. And then the other thing is uh Ian Hunter, a great songwriter. Some people might know him from being the leader of Mock the Hoople, the singer of all the young dudes. And he has a, a line, I want to leave you in someone else's dreams. And that, that's really the, the thing for me is uh, I, I want you to wake up thinking about somebody you met through one of my songs. And then you think about it. It's like, oh, man, I'm thinking about a person that might not even exist. That's a character for one of Robert's songs. Uh, so I want to leave you in someone else's dreams and I want to reflect what you are in case you don't know. Mission statement, vision statement, you know. Artists Robert, out there, take a lesson. Absolutely. Robert Andrew Wagner of the Little Wretches. Go to littlewretches.com and you can find out all the information you need about him, his band, his work, and how you can pick up a CD of one of his albums. He's got several. And, uh, and uh, the current one, which is um i forget the Un name undesirables and anarchists pick up that one up it's a it's it's a, it's a, i've been listening to the music i get to listen to it all because michael sends it to me so that i can have it so that's great and i really appreciate the time that you take with us sir thank it's been a pleasure thank you and you have everybody have a great afternoon take care of yourself right um robert i got to do this and then i'll be right back Hey, and thanks for listening to this episode all the way to the end. Hey, pretty cool. Hey, don't forget to follow us so you can receive regular updates and new posts. And remember, take care of each other because each other's all we've got. See you next time on My Independence Report.